I'm Mohsen Magadam. I'm an assistant professor in mechanical industrial engineering. I also have a, an affiliated position with the Corey College of Computer Sciences at Northeastern. I became a researcher because I'm interested in solving problems and solving problems that have both uh, scientific merit and also have some impacts in society. And uh, that's what we do as researchers. My background is uh, in manufacturing and automation. My PhD advisor is one of the pioneers in industrial automation. And that, that is one inspiration for me, that automation, modern automation, studies from MIT Work of the Future Task Force show that um, automation, modern automation, the new wave of automation is not about replacing people anymore. It was about finding a way to create teamwork between people and technology. The other part of my background was manufacturing, that, that, that design and manufacturing mostly, engineering. And um, that's what made me interested in contexts that range from uh, designing a product all the way to manufacturing it, the entire product development life cycle. So within this life cycle, uh, what we are trying to accomplish is that we are trying to understand how technology uh, can augment people. Teenagers know uh, mainstream technology. Now, nowadays, everybody is um, all like excited about technologies such as ChatGPT and um, and some Marvel movies. Like uh, our students in our lab, they, they usually use the metaphor of Iron Man, for example, and uh, the Iron Man suit and how uh, he works, how the suit helps Iron Man become Iron Man and do Iron Man stuff. So the way I would explain it to a teenager would be. Um, we are trying to develop new technology based on AI technology such as ChatGPT that everybody knows about nowadays, like more or less, um, to help people do their job better, more efficiently, learn their jobs faster, and become more skilled. And um, the specific work context that we focus on are design and manufacturing. For example, take a uh, someone uh, who works in a factory or someone who works in a construction site or some, some nurse or some surgeon uh, performing some tasks that are complex, we call them uh, complex psychomotor tasks, right? So in order for them to perform that task without any errors and to perform it in the most efficient way, they need to be what? They need to be experts, right? Uh, but not everyone is an expert and we need these people to handle these jobs, to take care of these jobs in the future, right? We are currently working on two specific tasks to help designers innovate and create new products that are more user-centered, that are centered to what people want to see in the next generation of that product. It could be an incremental innovation or um, radical innovation. So the first line of research uh, tries to understand how we can develop specialized AI models based on large language models like ChatGPT or GPT-4 and other LAMA um, that can understand what people want, what people don't want, what people have complained about, summarize them all, and eventually, that's the, the ultimate vision, try to understand uh, the implicit and latent needs of users, like the needs that they don't even know they have. And then the second piece of that is how can we then use this data this information that we've extracted from these online reviews to inform design, to, um, to build an AI that helps designers um, generate concepts that are more novel, more diverse, and more desirable centered on user feedback. And uh, we all, to some extent, are familiar with mid-journey nowadays or like these uh, generative AI models that can generate images um, based on the prompts that you provide to them. Um, so the, te the underlying technology is that, is generative AI. And uh, what we're trying to accomplish is that we, um, again, the vision, and we have some preliminary results on that, is to take the insights that we have drawn from 
customer reviews and then find a way to automatically feed them into those generative AI architectures and build our own architectures such that it can generate new designs that not only look cool and realistic, but also have some potentially high level of novelty and desirability. In this case, desirability means will my customers want it? If I make this product today and sell it and wait for a year, will I get positive reviews or negative reviews, right? So that would actually close the loop. So that's the first line. And the whole goal here is not to come up with an AI system that would eventually replace designers, but our goal is to turn this into a tool for designers to get more creative, to go from their own, uh, trying to sort of like create and innovate out of, from scratch. They can actually interact with the tool, they can give it prompts, they can explore the customer needs, they can go over the latent needs summaries that are provided by the system, or they can go over and uh, uh, go over the, uh, the samples generated by the generative AI, right? And then take it from there and then start use that as a starting point and as, as inspiration to then uh, innovate. The second piece is AI plus extended reality. And that is actually driven by the growing skills gap in industry, specifically in manufacturing or in industry in general, especially in, in the US and Western countries. Uh, that the uh, workforce right now is aging. There are statistics that show that over the next decade there will be a significant shortage of skilled workers because first of all the skilled workforce that we have right now is aging and they will retire very soon. Um, there is no way to for us to capture their expertise. There is no way for us to systematically um, collect their expertise and transfer it to the new generation. And at the same time, it's very difficult to, to find trainers, to find experts to train these new workforce because of like, the geographic constraints and because of the lack of, um, again, skilled trainers to train people. So the question is, how can we use technology to help people learn and uh, upskill, to help manufacture, help industries upskill their existing workforce and also help the new for workforce um, learn faster uh, and become skilled in specific tasks that are not going to be automated in the future, in the near future at least. So the technology that we are developing is AI uh, combined with extended reality to, um, as I mentioned, uh, the vision is to turn it into an intelligent assistant that would constantly keep track of uh, uh, the context constantly keeps track of what is happening in the environment, what is happening, where the user is in, in the task that they're performing, right? What is their cognitive state? What is their level of expertise associated with that particular part of the task, right? Particular step of the task. And, uh, and then when to intervene and how to intervene, right? And the interventions will be in different ways of like, uh, through extended reality, through mixed reality technology. And you can imagine Microsoft HoloLens or Apple Vision Pro that you're doing your task, you're wearing this pair of glasses, and then uh, it already knows where you are, it already knows what you've done, and if you actually make a mistake or if you forget something, or if you need, if you're stuck, and if you need some help, right, you can initiate an interaction with it through dialogue. So that's one way of initiation of interaction. And then the other one is that the system constantly keeps track of your task progress through computer vision technologies, through different sensors that are constantly scanning the environment. If it's a human-machine interaction scenario, it would be also the IoT data that you can pull from the machines and from other sensors in the system. And then we create, we paint a relatively accurate, to the extent possible, picture of uh, the context, what is happening in the environment right now, right? And the system already has this knowledge of, again, that's the inference engine piece of it, that it already has this knowledge of when to intervene, what is the um, best time to intervene, and then how should the system intervene. One area of research that uh, my lab is working on is uh, trying to accelerate 
this transition from novice to expert. So try to uh, use technology, um, specifically AI and extended reality, which is an umbrella term for virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, everybody knows, or like most people know about Pokemon Go, for example, that's an example of an augmented reality technology, right? That you see the physical world, you also see some virtual content superimposed on your physical world. So uh, what we're trying to accomplish, one line of research in my lab uh, focuses on um, building new AI technologies for specifically for head-mounted augmented reality, augmented and mixed reality. Uh, like Microsoft HoloLens or the new Apple product, Apple Vision Pro, right? To turn this technology into uh, an intelligent assistant for industrial workers. That you can imagine that you walk into a factory, you walk into your workstation, and you put the headset on, then the headset can walk you through every single step that you need to perform in order to successfully accomplish that operation, that part of your task. Uh, that's the technology that exists nowadays, but what we are trying to do is that we are trying to take it to the next level by incorporating some AI capabilities that uh, would uh, enable this technology to not only provide you with uh, information at the right time, right position, spatial temporal alignment of instructions on the physical workspace, but also constantly keep track of uh, your task performance, constantly keep track of what you're doing, what you're paying attention to, what your intent is, and also what your level of expertise is, for example, and what your cognitive load is, right? And collect all of this information to provide you with the right type of intervention. You can assume the metaphor that we use is that um, uh, we have a consultant who works with us, uh, and then the metaphor that we use is that you can assume that you have the miniature version of that person inside the headset, looking over your shoulder all the time and monitoring your performance, right? So as a human, when you want to, uh, as a trainer training someone, right, you need to constantly keep track of what they're doing, what they're paying attention to, how good they are, have they made any mistakes, have they forgotten anything, right? And uh, if you're a good trainer, you know exactly when to intervene and how to intervene, right? That's what we are trying to accomplish by incorporating AI into extended reality. Specifically, extended XR again is an umbrella term into augmented and mixed reality technology. The advice I, that I have for students who want to be inventors is that first of all, try to identify the right problem to solve because it's easy to get distracted by things that are not necessarily good problems. The two main foundational elements of every single NSF proposal, every single NSF project, and again, the assumption is that NSF is the National Science Foundation. Right? That's the, the leading, one of the leading um, agencies in science in the world, right? Is there are two main elements, intellectual merit, broader impacts, right? What does that mean? You want to work on something that is scientific, right? That has some scientific merit, that you advance science in whatever way, whatever form, right? But at the same time, it's grounded in some real world scenarios, right? You want to solve something in the real world based on using that science. You don't want to just um, work on something that is cool, that is complex, right? But has very limited practical implications. So the question that I always ask my students at least is that, who cares? Like what you're proposing to me, right? What you really want to do, right? Just think about it, who cares about it? Like what problem will you be solving? Because at the end of the day, compare two scenarios. One, you find a high impact, challenging problem, but your innovation is relatively simple, right? And then the other one is that you innovate something that is super complex, but it's not grounded anywhere. You cannot really use that technology to solve something significant in the real world, right? You don't make it big difference, right? Which one is more valuable? We all know that the first one, right? So uh, I think that's an Einstein quote that, you know, I, finding, defining the problem, finding the right problem is like 50% of the way, right? So if you want to innovate, find 
find the right problem to work on. And then from that point on, then this is, everything else is secondary. You first need to try to frame and formulate a meaningful, compelling, high impact problem. And there's many problems out there to solve, right? But it's very important to be careful that your problem has, what you're trying to innovate has some scientific merit and also will have some impact in the real world. Okay. Northeastern is a very interesting university. I mean, the, the, even like the motto is like a university like no other. I mean, um, it's, a, it's a very vibrant environment. It's rapidly growing and it's relatively, compared to like other institutions that I know about more or less, it's a relatively flat organization in the sense that between faculty, between colleges, right? It's very easy to, at least it's been easy for me, to, uh, to initiate collaborations with other faculty. Right now, I've been here at Northeastern for five years, and uh, I'm very grateful for the, uh, all the, and all of them are more senior than me, all the co-PIs and PIs that I have right now that I'm working with. I'm, right now I'm working with, on active grants, I'm working with over 10 faculty from four different colleges at Northeastern. And I knew none of them before I came to Northeastern, even in my first year. And um, it's, uh, and also Northeastern provides a lot of support to junior faculty. They, um, um, including Center for Research Innovation and New Res, ARC, uh, Mariah Nobrega, I want to mention her and the team. Uh, they've been very helpful that, you know, when I wanted to, like, for example, I'm working on a proposal and it's an interdisciplinary proposal. I know exactly, to some extent, not exactly, I know that I need a co collaborator from Northeastern in this particular domain. I reach out to them and then they connect me to that particular person. And that's how I've actually uh, initiated my collaborations with most of the, my, my current collaborators, right? So. It's, it's been a very rewarding experience uh, in the sense that, you know, working with someone outside of your discipline is not easy, it's outside of your comfort zone. But again, finding those collaborators, finding resources has been um, streamlined, at least for me. I, for, I know for all the faculty at Northeastern. Uh, and the other uh, positive about Northeastern is Boston. There are, my work involves uh, has very close connections with industry. And there's so many companies uh, in this area and we're working closely with a few of them. And that is also another factor and also other universities in the area, of course. In terms of research, I want to delve deeper into this notion of technology helping humans and there's so many other unknowns, so many other interesting areas to explore and uh, the vision that I have is that um, I want to explore for my research, for our research in this lab, uh, I want to explore other types of technology, other ways of uh, helping humans identify new problems again. Uh, that fall under the same umbrella of technology serving humans. So that's the vision that I have. And eventually the two lines of research that we have right now, I'm trying to find a way to, they have been informing each other. I mean, on surface, they don't look very like close or like very similar to each other. One of them focuses on design, need finding, generative design, the other one XR, enab AR enabled XR for to facilitate, to, to, uh, to help manufacturing, industrial workers get their job done faster and more efficiently and learn faster and more efficiently, right? But um, there are many opportunities to bring these two together and then go beyond training uh, use cases and do um, work on some interesting problems that I have uh, in mind for, for my next proposals, for my next, for my career proposal on uh, using this technology in other domains or like extending this technology to other domains. In terms of teaching, 
Uh, we are super excited. I should mention that and thank the MIE um, administration and also the provost and the dean's office uh, for sponsoring the cyber physical manufacturing lab. If those of, I mean, if you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you. It's in the basement of Forsyth. It's a laboratory that uh, we designed in collaboration with Festo Didactic. It's a model factory for Industry 4.0. It's a future factory setup designed for education and training. It has uh, conveyor systems, mobile robots, robot arms, CNC machines, engravers, etc., etc. It has two production lines. One is a mock-up of a cell phone production line, an automated cell phone production line, and the other one is a manufacturing line with a CNC machine and laser engraver and inspection systems and so on. So it's a it's a factory designed for teaching. So all these specific technologies used there from sensors to PLCs to robots to everything that is there is industry grade, but uh, the product and the process are intentionally oversimplified for educational purposes. We started teaching this lab last year. It was very, we got very positive feedback from the students. And um, we're all very excited about the future of it because so far it's been uh, serving the manufacturing courses, but other faculty, other colleagues are now becoming more interested in adopting it for education. So what is next for me? I teach undergraduate and graduate courses in manufacturing. And uh, it's been a, again, a very interesting transformation, especially with the lab. Uh, for like in terms of education, in terms of like providing uh, state-of-the-art content to our students. Uh, a new course that I'm designing right now is industrial extended reality. And what I'm trying to do in, in terms of teaching is to bring what we are learning about and what we are doing on the research side into this uh, undergraduate and graduate level course in extended reality and use the cyber physical manufacturing lab as a test bed for teaching to, uh, to for example, again, we're all very excited about Apple Vision Pro. You can imagine that in a few years, we will have a couple of those headsets in the lab. The students walk in, put the headset on, and go through the training with very minimal intervention from TAs or instructors. So that's the vision that we have. And then uh, you can, um, and then these two, education and research, will end up informing each other because uh, Eventually, the technology becomes more and more intelligent, and then the feedback that we collect from the students and from the experiences that we do in the lab will inform the design of that intelligent system. So that's the vision that I have for the next few years, at least. Uh, we have been working very closely with CRI, and I should thank them uh, for their support, in specifically in the design project, AdaTech, um, the, the outcomes of our impact engine then, then led to a spark fund project uh, with my colleagues Tucker Marion, Paolo Ciccarelli, and Lu Wang, who is now at the University of Michigan, and our team. Um, they have been very helpful in connecting us with uh, potential investors and uh, providing us. I had very little experience and and uh, background in commercializing uh, research ideas. And uh, the interesting thing about this project, or maybe I shouldn't say our project is interesting, but the interesting experience that we've had is that everything started, everything started with a tier one grant that led to an NSF project. And then we are now juggling between an NSF project, which is like pure research, and a commercialization, which is maybe not juggling. We are actually, these two, we, we are right now we're working on two projects at the same time. One of them focuses on fundamental research, the other one is commercialization. And we have two teams, you have teams of RAs and we have teams of developers through AdaTech sponsored by the Spark Fund that is provided by, uh, sponsored by Center for Research Innovation. And it's a very interesting experience, like these interactions with the graduate students and faculty and the professional developers and your Designing is like a just-in-time design of algorithms that you design, you validate, you publish, you uh, disclose, and then you put it on the platform through this uh, SparkFun project. So it's been a very interesting, very rewarding experience for us. 
uh, still a lot to learn, but uh, sp uh, the Center for Research Innovation has been very, uh, very supportive. We have uh, bi-weekly meetings with them. We used to have weekly meetings, now we have bi-weekly or like once a month. Yeah, we have an IER uh, who is a consultant with extensive industry experience working with us. Calvin Smith is our IER and uh, he's been he has brought a lot of new interesting perspective to the project. He meets with, with us on a weekly basis and we ended up submitting an NSF SPIR grant together. So it's been, again, a very interesting, very rewarding experience for us. And uh, I thank CRI and all the, uh, like the entire team for their support. We have been um, we have had the privilege of working with uh, Center for Research Innovation. We have uh, Impact Engines, Spark Fund grants, and uh, this research, the fundamental research, is sponsored by the National Science Foundation as well, Engineering Design and System Engineering. Um, and uh, we have a startup. It's in very early stages, but right now we are working with uh, a major sneaker design and manufacturing firm and an electronic products firm on two sets of consumer products to help them. And then we have actually active partnership with one of them to test the platform. Uh, it's called ADA, Advanced Design Augmentation uh, for Designers. <clears throat> Just to briefly mention and acknowledge, it is also sponsored by the NSF uh, Future of Work program. We also recently received another NSF uh, RETL program, Research on Technologies in Teaching and Learning. And um, it's a relatively large initiative that right now I'm working with colleagues from College of Social Sciences and Humanities, colleagues from Cattler, uh, from Corey College of Computer Sciences, from Computer Engineering. It's, an, it's a truly interdisciplinary effort because we need learning scientists on the team, we need social scientists, we need computer scientists, um, engineers, and so on and so forth.